Thanks for joining me in today's video Bible study. My name is Ryan Goodwin. I preach for the East Shelby Church of Christ in Collierville, Tennessee. If you have any questions or comments about what we study today, you can leave them in the comment section below. Or if you'd like to learn more about our congregation, then you can find information at eastshelby.com. We've been in the book of Ecclesiastes lately, so if you've got your Bibles handy, open up to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. The text reads, There is a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun, riches being hoarded by their owner to his hurt. When those riches were lost through a bad investment, and he had fathered a son, then there was nothing to support him. As he had come naked from his mother's womb, so will he return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. And this also is a grievous evil. Exactly as a man is born, thus will he die. So what is the advantage to him who toils for the wind? Throughout his life, he also eats in darkness with great vexation, sickness, and anger. So it shouldn't surprise us that Solomon spends a great deal of time in Ecclesiastes talking about wealth. After all, he was not only blessed with incredible wisdom, but he was also blessed with incredible earthly blessings. He had luxuries beyond our imagination, palaces, and he planted forests, and he had gardens, but he also had slaves and concubines. If there was anybody whose word we could trust when it came to the vanity of wealth and luxury, it would be Solomon. So he goes out of his way to pick something that is particularly evil. He calls it a grievous evil under the sun. And whenever you see that phrase in the book of Ecclesiastes, that's, to me, that, that's telling you to pay attention because a particularly vain thing is about to be brought up. Now, of course, Solomon's talked about a lot of evil things and vain things already, but when he says there is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun, he's saying this is something that is particularly evil. This is particularly offensive when you sit and examine it and consider it. So what is this particularly grievous evil that he's going to mention here in verse 13? Well, it's the idea of riches being hoarded by their owner to his hurt. Now, we normally think of riches as something that is good, and if not good, then certainly morally neutral. We don't think of it as a grievous evil. In fact, most of the time, earthly wealth is what we use to ensure safety and security for our families. With our wealth, we're able to pay our bills, pay our taxes, buy our groceries, buy a home, or pay our rent. With our wealth, we're able to take our kids on vacation and buy an automobile. And so, wealth normally is thought of as something that's useful. And, and again, if not good outright, then at least morally neutral. But he says it is a grievous evil to hoard your riches to your own hurt. Wealth can end up hurting you when you hoard it. Now, I think in particular what he means is when there's something you need to be doing with your wealth. The idea of saving is not necessarily what he's talking about. So if you're reading here in Ecclesiastes 5 and you're thinking he, he, he's, he, he says there's a problem with having a 401k or a savings account, that, that's not really what he's talking about here. What he means is when you need to be using your wealth for something, when you have a family to take care of, but you're unwilling to pay the bills to take care of your family... That's an evil thing. When there are people that need your money because of an act of charity, because you need to be participating in some good deed, some charity to help your brother or sister, to help your family member, to be a useful part of your community, and you're not using your wealth for that, you're just hoarding it for yourself, that is when it becomes evil. When there's something you need to be doing with your wealth that is productive and good and wholesome and useful, but you're refusing to do that just so you can hoard it all to yourself? I think that's the grievous evil that he's talking about here. Even worse in verse 14, when those riches are lost through a bad investment and he's someone who has a son, well, what is he going to do to take care of that son now? You know, when you take all of your money and you put it in just one spot, you are, you're hoarding it, right? You're hoarding it. You're putting it in one treasure chest. You're putting it in one nest. 
you're hiding all of it in one spot, maybe under the, under the mattress in your bedroom or something like that. But when you put all of your money hoarded into one spot, all it takes is one bad thing for that to all go away. For a bank to fail, a market to crash, one particular commodity to become worthless, uh, the company, right, that you, you poured all of your money in, you invested in a, in a startup company, and then that startup goes belly up, and you've lost everything. Well, what are you going to do now to take care of your family? Where did all that supposed security and safety go? And I say supposed because really when it comes to wealth, there is no such thing as true safety and security. It is an illusion when it comes to wealth. Uh, go to 1 Timothy chapter 6 in the New Testament. Now, this is a passage that we looked at last week, but I think it's worth pointing out again. There's a sentiment expressed here in 1 Timothy chapter 6 in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul says, beginning in verse 7. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. That sounds a lot like Ecclesiastes chapter 5, doesn't it? Verse 8, and if we have food and covering with these things, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many a pang. To those who are rich, he goes on in verse 17. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Our riches are not life indeed. Our career is not life indeed. Your house, your car, your treasures, your collections, your investments, your retirement, none of that is life indeed. We take hold of life indeed by refusing to put stock in the treasures of the earth and instead investing in the treasures of heaven. And I think that's a point that Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes is trying to get across to us. As we had come naked from our mother's womb, so we shall return, he says in Ecclesiastes 5. Again, you see that connection between 1 Timothy 6 and what Paul says in Ecclesiastes 5 and what Solomon says. You don't get to take any of it with you. And I think even unbelievers understand that, right? You don't have to be a Christian. You don't have to believe in the Bible. You don't have to be a big fan of the book of Ecclesiastes to acknowledge that you don't take any of it with you. In spite of what the pharaohs of Egypt thought, you don't get to take any of it with you. You don't. And I know some people wonder, well, like... What if there's this one thing that's really important to me? My, my, my one most valuable treasure, like the one, the family heirloom, or you know, that, that, that thing that just is so valuable to me, can't I at least take that with me? What if I'm buried with my stuff? Like what if I fill my coffin with a bunch of hundred dollar bills and I just take it all with me? You don't get to take any of it with you in a spiritual sense. Now, like the pharaohs of Egypt, you can, you can fill a tomb with all the treasures that you want. You, you can cover yourself in a gold sarcophagus when you get buried. You can be very wealthy and opulent in that physical sense at your death. But when you're facing God on the judgment day, and it's just you and what you've done with your life, and God on the other side, you have no answer. If all you did was put stock in earthly things. God will ask you, what did you do with your life? What did you do? What kind of investments did you make? What kind of treasures did you seek? And you'll say, I worked all those hours, but I neglected my Bible study. You'll have to say, I put stock in career achievements rather than meeting spiritual milestones or benchmarks. Becoming a partner or a CEO or a business owner or a millionaire was more important to me 
than striving to be an elder in the church. Raising my bank account was more important than raising my children. And I loved my earthly treasures more than I loved my heavenly treasures. That is a very uncomfortable, very tragic, very difficult conversation that a lot of, that a lot of people are going to have to have in the end. As he'd come naked from his mother's womb, again in verse 15, so will he return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. And this also is a grievous evil, verse 6. Exactly as a man is born, thus will he die. So, what is the advantage to him who toils for the wind? You know, God made you with a soul and a physical body. And at your death, you're not even going to have that physical body anymore, right? The soul will be parted from the physical body and you will ascend in a spiritual sense to, to meet God, to meet your maker, your creator, and your judge. Just as you came into this world with nothing, so you will leave this world with nothing, at least in a physical sense. In a physical sense. I wonder, he says, what is the advantage to the one who toils, right? What was the point of it all? Now, I know that Solomon didn't know who Ebenezer Scrooge was. I know the Christmas Carol was not written until the 19th century. But I have a hard time in this passage as well as in chapter 6 as well, which we'll look at here in a few moments, I have a hard time not seeing the connection there, right, to a character like Ebenezer Scrooge. This is a man who isolated himself and he alienated himself from the people who cared about him. Uh, Ebenezer Scrooge did not, he did not pursue the love of his family members. He did not pursue romantic love with the woman who loved him. This is a man who... He was so isolated, but surrounded by his money, miserly, lonely, but rich. Hey, right? What else do you need if you're rich? When you've got money in the bank, but you've got a cold, dark, lonely home and no love to share. I see a lot of Ebenezer Scrooge in the book of Ecclesiastes. Throughout his life, it says in verse 17, He eats in darkness with vexation, sickness, and anger. Let's go on to verse 18 now. And read 18 through 20. Here is what I have seen to be good and fitting. To eat, to drink, and enjoy oneself in all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life which God has given him. For this is his reward. Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God, for he will not often consider the years of his life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart. Now, I don't think that Solomon is being facetious or sarcastic or anything here when he's saying this. I think he legitimately views this as a reward. That if only you could just enjoy the things God has given to you. If you could could live in such a way that you could enjoy the benefits of the wealth that's been given to you without being obsessed over the wealth that's been given to you. I think we need to acknowledge something. Wealth is not a, at least a moral, in a moral sense, a bad thing. It's just an amoral thing. It's neither pure good or pure evil. It just is what it is. Coins are just coins. Dollars are just dollars. Gold is just, it's just a rock that you find in the ground. But what you can do with that wealth, what you can do with that wealth is take care of the medical bills that you have. What you can do with that wealth is you can provide opportunities for your children to, to learn and to play sports. What you can do with that wealth is to put a roof over your head and to take care of your family. What you can do with that wealth is buy groceries and cook a delicious homemade meal. It doesn't cost a lot of money to bake bread. It doesn't cost a lot of money to make a great pot of soup. What you can do with that wealth when you have it is take your kids on a vacation. 
Get them away from the routine, from the mundane. Go out and see some sights. See creation. See the natural wonders. Go to a national park. What you can do with that wealth is actually enjoy the world that God created to be enjoyed. He did not create this world to be some miserable place. It was not created as some kind of like, like sad puzzle that needed to be solved. It wasn't created just to be some, like some science experiment or, or, or a maze for little lab rats. And we're the rats wandering around looking for a piece of cheese. You know, God created this world in Genesis chapter 1 as a good thing. He looked at every part of his creation, the trees and the sky, the animals on the land, the birds in the air, and the fish in the sea, and he looked at man as well. And at the end of Genesis chapter 1, he said, this is good. God created something good. And we're meant to be grateful. So again, I I don't see sarcasm here. I don't think that Solomon is being satirical here. I think when he says verses 18 through 20, he really means it. That if you've been given physical blessings from God, and, and not everybody does get physical blessings, at least always, but when you have been given physical blessings from God, be grateful for it. Be grateful. You know, we're not asked by God to take a vow of poverty. We're not asked by God to deny ourselves things of this world that are good and wholesome and delicious and enjoyable and beautiful. We're not asked by God. We're not commanded by God to deny those things, at least within the context of his will and what he's revealed in Scripture. And it shows ingratitude on our parts to deny those things. If you have earthly blessings, physical, carnal blessings, if you have those earthly blessings, show your gratitude to God by using them the way they were meant to be used. Enjoy them the way that God intended for you to enjoy them. Understanding, of course, that we'll be judged for our behavior, so we need to remain moral and follow His will, but enjoy those things. This is a reward from God. This is a gift from God, it says in verse 19. And we don't have very many years on planet Earth either. You may die today, you may die tomorrow, you may die 20 or 30 or 40 years from now. But the fact is that they all go like a vapor, and your life will be over. Just like that. And so as long as you are here, enjoy this world for what it is. And thank God for all of the beautiful, wonderful, and abundant blessings that surround us. Now that's a little ray of sunshine in the midst of Solomon's cloudy day. And he continues in chapter 6 with this in verse 1. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is prevalent among men. This is a very commonplace evil that he's noticed. He says in verse 2, A man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor so that his soul lacks nothing of all that he desires, but God has not empowered him to eat from them, for a foreigner enjoys them. This is vanity and a severe affliction. And I wonder... If Solomon is talking a little bit about himself here. Because surely, if if there was anybody ever to whom God had given riches, wealth, and honor so that his soul lacks nothing of all that he desires, that was Solomon. If Solomon wanted something, he had it. Everything that his eyes desired back in chapter 2 of Ecclesiastes, everything that his eyes desired, he could have it in abundance with extra left over. And yet he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. A man who had all of his heart's desire, a man who effectively had all of his dreams come true, a man who essentially had everything that he ever wanted, wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And so I wonder if verse 2 is a little bit about him. Solomon looks around at all of his wealth. All of his stuff, his treasures, the food on his table, 
the space that surrounds him and all of its opulence and the luxury. And he feels so stupid because he had allowed all of these foreigners to come into his life and consume him. Now, I want to be very clear about something. The word foreigner, uh, of course, is a very loaded word. We're not We're not making a political statement here, right? He's not talking about 21st century politics and immigration and that sort of thing, right? When he talks about foreigner, what he's saying is, I have welcomed 700 wives into my life. All of them were from nations that were not Israel. All of them brought idolatry with them. All of them brought immorality with them. These 700 wives that he'd surrounded himself with pulled his heart away from God. And and I imagine that with all of these 700 wives, these 700 wives also brought with them an entourage, right? This wife over here from Egypt brought all of her friends and her maidens and all of the people, you know, more mouths to feed. And so for every one of these 700 wives and 300 concubines, they also brought with them more people, more mouths to feed, more people to consume his household. And these were not people who worshipped God. These were not people who who helped Solomon grow closer to his Lord. These were not people that encouraged worship in the temple. These were not people that kept his eyes away from idolatry. These were people that actually pulled him away from God. Do you think verse 2 has a little hint of regret attached to it? This is a grievous evil. This is a very commonplace thing that when God has given you riches and blessings and wealth and honor and God is taking care of all your physical needs and God has given you everything that you need. But then you have surrounded yourself with people who are moochers and takers and consumers and bad influences. And you are then incapable You have made yourself incapable of enjoying the blessings that God has given to you. Verse 3. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, however many they may be, but his soul is not satisfied with good things, and he does not even have a proper burial, then I say, better the miscarriage than he. For it comes in futility and goes into obscurity, and its name is covered in obscurity. It never sees the sun. It never knows anything. It is better off than he, even if the other man lives a thousand years twice and does not enjoy good things. Do not all go to one place. I understand that's a very, uh, that's a very dark take that Solomon has on this. But we're talking about things under the sun. Solomon is talking about things under the sun. He's saying, if you just look at things how they are, just the way the world works, the way people tend to be, if you just look at physical things, life under the sun, it would be better to have been a miscarriage. Better to have never even seen the sun. Better to have just disappeared into obscurity, to be forgotten and to have never lived than to have lived this vain life that he's describing in these verses. If you have a hundred children, I mean, as much honor as that is, if you have a hundred children, but you can't stop and smile and take comfort and enjoy the blessings that you have and look to God. If you live a thousand years twice, what good is all of that? What good is a thousand years twice over If it's a wasted 2,000 years. You know, the Bible even has examples of that. In the book of Genesis, we read about how old some of those first people were. You know, those first few chapters of Genesis, the way that Adam and his children and his grandchildren, and Methuselah in particular, these people lived 800, 900 plus years even. I mean, that's almost 1,000 years. And there's not a whole lot written about these people in Genesis. There's just not a whole lot that's worth noting. You know, Methuselah lived all those years, 969 years, and what did he really accomplish in all that? In all those years, almost a thousand years of life, what did Methuselah really accomplish? You could live a thousand years twice over, but according to the text, the way he sees it, if you don't enjoy good things, 
if you don't enjoy the things God has given to you, we all just go to the same place anyway, don't we? And whether you're dirt poor and you get buried in a potter's graveyard somewhere, or you're the richest man who's ever lived and you get buried in a tomb in a gold sarcophagus, we all go to the same place, don't we? Worm food. Verse 7. All a man's labor is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage does the wise man have over the fool? What advantage does the poor man have, knowing how to walk before the living? What the eyes see is better than what the soul desires. This too is futility and striving after the wind. I like that in verse 7. All of a man's labor is for his mouth, yet the appetite is not satisfied. You work all those years, you work all those hours, you put all that money away, and what's it all for? You're never really satisfied, are you? You know, I eat in the morning, and about two hours later, I'm ready to eat again. And I have a nice lunch, and about two hours later, I'm hungry again. Got to have an afternoon snack. And about two hours later, I'm hungry for dinner. And about two hours after that, i got to have a snack before bedtime or a bowl of ice cream or something. You work and you work and you work. And the life that is obsessed with physical things is a lot like your stomach. To where you can feed it and you can feed it and you can feed it, but you're just hungry again a few hours later. You can't live for fleshly things. You can't live for just life under the sun because there's not enough here to truly satisfy you there is not enough under the sun to give you the eternal spiritual satisfaction that you're actually longing for so you can be surrounded with wealth and you can fill your belly with food and you can have all the nice things that this world has to offer but there's still a part of that puzzle that's missing there's still a part of your soul that goes beyond the flesh that just can't be satisfied. Of course, he goes on to say in verse 9, what the eyes see is better than what the soul desires. This too is futility and striving after the wind. There's a couple of different ways you can interpret that, but I tend to look at this here in verse 9, I tend to look at this as, you know, the, uh, the wanting is sometimes better than the having. You know, you, you want to have the big house, you know, as you go through life, you move up. You start off with like the little apartment. Uh, you know, you, you got the apartment and it's all like secondhand furniture. You know, the, the couch that like sinks down in the middle and the giant cable spool that's a dining room table or whatever, right? But then you get the starter home and the ranch house. And then you get the two-story house with a little bit of backyard. And, and you're always working toward the big house. You want the big house. Well, the big house costs more money to maintain. Property taxes are higher. More square footage to vacuum. You know, more stuff to, more stuff to take care of. More stuff that can go wrong. You want the sports car. Wouldn't it just be nice if I could just have the sports car? And full disclosure, I would like to have a sports car also. But you want to have the sports car and the wanting. Oh boy, wouldn't it just be so great? The wanting ends up being better than the having. Because the having is the maintenance and the bad gas mileage and that, that convertible top that's always leaking and you're always worried about parking somewhere and getting a ding on the side of your door from some knucklehead in the parking lot. right? The wanting is often better than the having. So let's bring this chapter to a close now in verses 10 through 12. Whatever exists has already been named. And it is known what man is, for he cannot dispute with him who is stronger than he is. For there are many words which increase futility. What then, it says in verse 11, what then is the advantage to a man? Verse 12, for who knows what is good for a man during his lifetime, during the few years of his futile life? He'll spend them like a shadow. For who can tell a man what will be after him under the sun? Verses 10 through 12 explain that there is nothing new under the sun. And he's kind of talked about this a little bit in chapter 1 already, very similar to those ideas in chapter 1. 
And I know it can seem very discouraging to us to realize that we can't create anything new. There's nothing that's not already been created. All we can do is just take old ideas and old products and repackage them in some way. And though people may try to develop the newest this or the brand new that, all things are basically just recycled ideas. And so what are you really working for? I, I think people want, to, people want to be revolutionaries and they want to be visionaries. And, and I think people want, they want to give the impression that they're smarter or more accomplished or more visionary than they really are. Uh, you know, you want to be the guy that comes out on a, on a stage wearing a, a black turtleneck right? A black turtleneck and thick rim glasses, and you want an audience full of people ooing and aweing at your new idea. Well, how, how long does that really last? There's nothing new that you can create. There is really no revolutionary brand new this or that idea. Everything's just old ideas that have just been repackaged. In verse 11, there are many words which increase futility. So what is the advantage to a man? A lot of words increase futility. You can talk and talk and talk and talk. That doesn't make you any smarter. In fact, sometimes it is in our abundance of words that our stupidity is revealed to the people around us. I know we'll study this in a few weeks in chapter 10, but I like the way it's put in chapter 10, verse 12. Ecclesiastes 10, 12, words from the wise, uh, or excuse me, words from the mouth of a wise man are gracious, while the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of his talking is folly, and the end of it is wicked madness. And yet, the fool multiplies words. And in an echo, back to chapter 6, no man knows what will happen, and who can tell him what will come after him. Verse 12, again, back in chapter 6. Who knows what is good for a man during his lifetime, during the few years of his futile life? He spends them like a shadow. Who really knows? Now, we have to understand, of course, that in Ecclesiastes, Solomon is talking about this journey that he's been on. He's trying to see if there is some kind of lasting satisfaction in life under the sun. That if you take God out of the equation and you just look at physical, earthly things, life under the sun. Is this a satisfying life? Is there contentment to be found? Happiness to be found, at least in a lasting way? Who knows what is good for a man during his lifetime? Who knows what is good during the few years? It's futile, and he spends them like a shadow. It's here and it's gone. The answer to his question is the one factor that most people on planet Earth are forgetting to bring into the equation. It's God. And people think it's career, and people think it's accomplishments, and people think it's politics, and people think it's earthly power or authority. People think it's maybe, maybe just family, country, and patriotism. It's God. God is the answer to the question that everybody is asking. But nobody wants to accept that answer. At least many people do not want to accept that answer. So who can tell a man what will happen after him under the sun? Again, God can. God knows what will happen. Now, maybe you're not a Christian. I certainly hope that you will study the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ, and consider very carefully what he has to say. In Mark 16, verse 16, it says, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And if you have a spiritual need, don't be afraid to reach out to the East Shelby Church of Christ. Leave a comment in the comment section. Find us at eshelby.com. Reach out to us and, and you can have a conversation with me. Give me a call on the phone, send me a text message or send me an email and we can begin a correspondence to get those questions answered. Those questions that have been gnawing away at you all this time and you'd like to have an answer to them finally. My friends, I hope that you have a blessed day and tune in to our next Bible study out of the book of Ecclesiastes.